welcome everybody. Um, this is our first um, Dean seminar for the spring semester of 2022. Um, and it's like mid-February, it just seems like the season has passed so much already. Um, it's really um, a pleasure to introduce to you um, Carrie Knowles. For those of you who don't know Carrie, um, she's a three-time graduate of UMass. And so that's just really a wonderful distinction to have. Um, she has been here with us and has seen every aspect of the university, and yet she has still decided to come and give back, and we're so thrilled that she was able to do that. She spent a year, um, a year or two as a postdoctoral um, train, a postdoctoral fellow at the, um, in the epidemiology branch at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health. And there she really applied her, her epidemiological interest in both epi and reproduction to environmental health. And today um, she's gonna be talking to us about the intersection of that and how she'll be able to identify or hopes to identify critical windows of, um, of, of importance for environmental toxicants influence on pregnancy outcomes. So Carrie, thank you so much. And we're so delighted to have you um, be here as a faculty member and to give the seminar today. Cool. Great, well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, so I'm very excited to be here um, today to talk about, so some of my work looking at air pollution exposure and particularly thinking in relation to um, reproduction as well as exposure during early pregnancy. Um, let me start here. And so I wanted to start um, just by talking about kind of setting the stage with a few motivating questions. So some of the questions that kind of guide how, how I interpret the work, work that I'm doing. Um, so first is this overarching question. So how does air pollution ex exposure affect reproduction in early pregnancy? So really getting at that, those etiologic questions. And with this, within this also looking at both kind of short as well as long-term impacts, um, and then thinking whether or not we can actually identify underlying mechanisms and susceptible reproductive processes. Um, and then related to that um, is the idea of, from this, can we identify whether there are critical exposure windows related to air pollution during reproduction, both for women as well as for men? And then also whether there might be critical exposure windows, and particularly for my research, looking at early pregnancy related to later pregnancy complications and offspring health. And then finally, for all of this, um, to think about, um, for most of my research being set in the U United States, are air pollution levels that we're exposed to in the US safe for reproduction and pregnancy? Um, and within this, so thinking about whether EPA guidelines are actually adequate to protect reproductive health, um, and even in the absence of policy changes in the future, are there opportunities for intervention? Um, so for the talk, so I'm going to start by giving some background and thinking about air pollution and its relationship with reproductive epidemiology, um, and then talk about some research findings. So looking at air pollution during reproduction in relation to fecundability and pregnancy loss, and then also some work we've done looking at exposure to air pollution early in pregnancy and how that's related to what we term these placentally related pregnancy complications. And I'm gonna end by talking about some future directions. So a little work we've done thinking about mechanisms and where that might go in the future, and also some work focusing specifically on men's reproductive health. Um, so I want to start by kind of more broadly talking about health effects of air pollution. Um, so we have relatively robust data suggesting that air pollution really has systemic effects where we see um, influence on increased inflammation and oxidative stress. So we see this from animal research as well as some controlled studies in human populations. Um, and so the main way that we're exposed to air pollution is through the lungs. So we breathe in particles, um, different gases and other air toxics, and it's in the lung tissue where this creates inflammation. Um, and it's thought by the main mechanism that we kind of see air pollution effects systemically is then by movement of that inflammation and oxidative stress and other factors into circulation throughout the body. But there's also been some emerging research suggesting that there might actually be some translocation, particularly of very small particles as well, um, that then can cause localized inflammation, oxidative stress systemically in the body. 
Um, and then through these different routes, so we see impacts particularly on vascular function, but on other factors as well. So when we go back to the literature, so kind of what we have the most robust evidence for in relation to air pollution. So we see fairly strong associations between ambient air pollution um, in both respiratory disease and cardiovascular disease. Um, so literature suggesting, so air pollution exposure may be related to a decrease in lung function. So we see studies seeing worsening COPD um, as well as asthma, and also some research saying it might make us more vulnerable to infection and also severity from some infectious diseases like COVID-19 um, more recently. Um, in addition to that, we also see relatively robust literature finding relationships between air pollution um, and heart disease. So particularly with incidents of myocardial infarction for looking at acute exposure, but also outcomes like stroke and hypertension. Um, and it's from these effects on the lungs and on the cardiovascular system that the World Health Organization has ranked air pollution as one of the major contributors globally to mortality. But in addition to these factors, we do see emerging evidence for a number of other systemic impacts related to air pollution. So this includes metabolic health, like for, for instance, incidence of diabetes, pregnancy health, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more, as well as mental health, neurodevelopment, dementia, and other outcomes as well. Um, so for this talk, so I'm going to be focusing on exposure to what are called the criteria air pollutants. Um, and these are air pollutants that are regulated by the EPA through the Clean Air Act with the goal of protecting um, environmental um, health as well as uh, public health. Um, and the air pollutant with probably the most robust relationship with health effects is particulate matter. Um, and this is particularly true for what we term fine particulate matter. Um, so you can see in the figure to the right, so fine particulate matter in pink, it's a fraction of a fraction of the diameter of um, a human hair. And it's thought that these particularly small particles um, may be able to pretend penetrate more deeply into the lungs and therefore cause more systemic effects. Um, but when we look at particulate matter, it's also a very heterogeneous, heter heterogeneous group of different suspended liquids and solids. Um, and this includes factors like element, elemental carbon, which we get from combustion, but also organics like bioaerosols that can include attached bacteria and fungi, as well as metals like lead. Um, so even in looking at particulate matter, what folks are exposed to can be very different depending on where they live and the local emission sources. So in addition to PM, so we're also gonna be looking at gaseous pollutants. So this includes products of combustion like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and carbon monoxide, as well as ozone, which is a secondary pollutant. Um, it is created through um, catalyzing mostly nitrogen dioxide, but also volatile organic compounds as well. Um, and this relationship can create some kind of interdependencies as well, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so, um, so for thinking about air pollution exposure in the United States um, and thinking about policies, so we're exposed, when we think about a global perspective, to relatively low to moderate levels of air pollution. Um, but you can see in the figure to the left, there are many localities in the United States that are not in what we call attainment of EPA guidelines for those criteria air pollutants. So for example, in the Northeast, specifically on the coast, we tend to have trouble being in attainment for ozone because we have an abundance of some of the precursors for ozone. Um, but this is true for a lot of other localities, um, particularly, for example, in California and some of the valleys. Um, and for thinking about kind of air pollution exposure, we also have um, the kind of upcoming challenge of thinking about the impact of climate change. Um, so we're already seeing an increase in wildfires in the West, and this trend is expected to get worse with time. So we're gonna see more exposure to PM 2.5 and other products of combustion, but also as we see increasing temperatures, um, we're expected to see an increase in generation of ozone as well. But kind of in combination with that though, also, in thinking about how you know, we create policies related to air pollution, we're also going to expect to see some movement towards energy transition, um, towards greener energy production, and kind of an upcoming opportunity to have these co-health benefits in terms of actually reducing air pollution levels, um, which really is very promising, but also raises a lot of concerns about issues of equity. Um, and understanding how air pollution impacts health 
um, including in reproductive health and during pregnancy is a really important component of that conversation. Um, and I wanted to also start by talking about some of the unique challenges related to doing kind of air pollution epidemiology. Um, so when we look at air pollution, so one of the things we're focused on is seeing very small effects overall. Like for example, you know, if we're looking at a high, a day that has a high exposure to fine particulate matter. So for a young adult who's relatively healthy and has no risk factors, we're not expected, we wouldn't expect that exposure to cause that person to have a heart attack. Um, but for an individual who has a lot of pre-existing risk, uh, risk factors, we might expect air pollution could potentially for that person push them over towards that event. Um, so in general, so we're looking for really small events, really small effects at the individual level, so small risks. But the problem with air pollution is that this is distributed across the whole population. Um, so we're all exposed to this. So in sum, this amounts to a really big pop, um, public health impact. Um, but in terms of actually detecting those individual effects, really necessitates that we use rely on relatively large cohorts. So that's somewhat limiting in terms of how we can look at air pollution exposures. Along with that, we generally have kind of bigger problems with misclassification of exposure. So when we look at ambient levels, so first we have to be able to estimate them um, with a re relatively good degree of precision. And we can do that kind of better for some pollutants and others better in some areas than others. But we also have the issue. So if we're saying, oh, this is a level outside someone's home, we're not accounting for the fact that person is gonna move around quite a bit. And even when they're home, they're often gonna be indoors. So that means that the exposure that we estimate for them, it's gonna be very imprecise. Um, and again, this is gonna make it really hard to be able to detect those small effects. And finally, so air pollution itself is a very complex mixture. Um, so we have a lot of codependencies between air pollutants related to kind of joint emission sources, related to chemistry. Um, for example, you know, if we look at NO2 and ozone, we have NO2 can be catalyzed into ozone, but can also scavenge ozone. So how do we take account take that into account in modeling. Um, we also have a lot of often missing components of the mixture and often very different precisions with which we're actually able to estimate different air pollution levels. And a lot of this can make it very difficult to tease out individual effects. So for most of the work I'm gonna be presenting, we're focused on single pollutant models. So models where we look at one air pollutant at a time and adjust for temperature season and some other factors. But again, there's an assumption that there could very likely be co-pollutant confounding but hopefully we're picking up some signal of that mixture. Um, but in taking into account some of these challenges, there's also some other major benefits of doing uh, research in air pollution. And one being that the way that we estimate ambient air pollution. So we can get a relatively great coverage in terms of geography, but also over time. So this allows us to look at relatively acute exposures across biologically relevant windows for, for the different health outcomes we're looking at and really be able to hone in on, you know, what are those most relevant kind of mechanisms and where do we want to kind of tailor what exposure window we look at. So for the studies I'm going to be talking about, um, so the air pollution modeling approach that we use is called a chemistry transport model. Um, and the specific model is a community multi-scale air quality model or the CMAC model. So this is a model developed by the EPA. And so what this does is it takes inputs from emission sources from meteorology and takes into account chemistry across the continent of the US to put output um, at the level of grid cells, so often 12 by 12 kilometer grid cells, and for daily exposure estimates. Um, so this output allows us for different studies to link um, air pollution exposure geographically where someone's most likely to be and then tailor that to those exposure windows. So it's a very useful modeling approach for the work that we're doing. And for this, so we collected information for all of the criteria pollutants. So for thinking about why is it important to look at air pollution in relation to reproduction in these early pregnancy windows? So there are a number of different biological processes that occur during reproduction and early pregnancy that are very uniquely vulnerable to imbalances and inflammatory factors and oxidative stress and angiogenic factors, and also the need for this process to establish maternal immune um, tolerance. So this includes gametogenesis, 
ovulation and conception, windows of implantation, and also development of the vasculature supporting the placenta. So there are many different important biological um, steps that can potentially be affected by air pollution, and that inflammation, oxidative stress, and vascular dysfunction associated with air pollution exposure. Um, and so these can result in impacts on a lot of important outcomes. So this includes infertility, which affects about 50%, about 15% of couples attempting pregnancy, pregnancy loss, which occurs in about a quarter of all pregnancies, and then some common pregnancy complications like preterm birth, fetal growth restriction, and preeclampsia. Um, so I'm going to start by presenting some of our work looking at air pollution exposure during reproduction in relation to fecundability and pregnancy loss. So just as a, a little bit of a primer, so fecundability is a measure looking at kind of this underlying couple level biologic capacity for reproduction. Um, so kind of the gold standard studies for doing this enroll couples who are attempting pregnancy. Um, so they're um, having intercourse within the fertile window and not using any contraceptive. And the idea if we follow the menstrual cycle by menstrual cycle to see how long it takes them to actually become pregnant, we can get a sense of how different factors affect that underlying capacity to become pregnant. So for this type of study design, um, so we follow up here, you can see one menstrual cycle. And some of the windows we're most interested in looking at in relation to fecundability include ovulation, um, which occurs about midway through the cycle. And you can see over here, the release of the ovary and is around the same time as conception. Um, and we're also interested in looking at about six to 10 days following that at the window of implantation. So this is when the blastocytes develops and differentiates and actually implants into the uterine wall. Um, and then starts forming the placenta and the vasculature supporting that. Um, so for thinking about air pollution and fecundability, we're thinking about, so what are these, some of these critical processes that exposure may interrupt and kind of honing in on these windows. And I've been fortunate, so in my postdoctoral work to have access to look at some of these really excellent um, kind of gold standard designs to think about some of these early pregnancy windows. Um, and so, <clears throat> So these include so the time to pregnancy studies. So these studies, again, are studies that enroll couples um, who are actively attempting pregnancy and then follow them menstrual cycle by menstrual cycle until they achieve pregnancy and if they become pregnancy, usually throughout pregnancy as well. And there's two big strengths of this. Um, and the first is that we get this measure of fecundability. So this underlying biologic capacity for reproduction. And the second strength, um, so you can see when we follow menstrual cycle by menstrual cycle, um, we have this really early testing at the end of each cycle for HCG to detect pregnancy. So we also get early detection of pregnancy, but also within that an early detection of pregnancy loss. So we're capturing a lot of pregnancy losses that otherwise would be missed if we're enrolling women who are accessing prenatal care. So the study that we assessed air pollution and fecundability as in the um, longitudinal investigation of fertility in the environment or the life study. Um, so this is a study that enrolled 501 couples. So it's a little bit of a smaller study that were attempting pregnancy and followed them for up to one year. Um, and so for this, we wanted to look at, so we had this daily average air pollution exposure and we wanted to look at what is the effect of acute exposure to air pollution during some of these sensitive windows during the menstrual cycle. Um, and so we chose to look at daily average exposure from five days before ovulation to up to 10 days following ovulation. So encompassing these windows leading up to ovulation conception and also during implantation. Um, and so for this study, so in addition to the acute windows, we did look at cycle average exposure. Um, so for the cycle in which pregnancy you know, was being attempted as well as the one before and didn't see much of a relationship. But we did see a few signals come up for looking at these daily acute exposures. So you can see on the left, so this is for, it's an interquartile change in nitrogen oxide exposure. So it's a relatively large change. Um, but you can see um, along the bottom, so this running from five days before ovulation to 10 days following ovulation and highlighted here but we consider the window leading up to ovulation and the window of implantation. And during implantation, so we see a relationship between higher exposure to nitrogen oxides and a lower odds of, of pregnancy. 
And so for fecundability, this is estimating a cycle-specific probability of pregnancy. So lower means less likely to get pregnant. And then similarly, so looking for ozone, um, we see a little bit of an asso a similar association during implantation, but particularly around the time of ovulation. We see um, for a few days leading up to ovulation, a relationship between higher exposure to ozone and lower fecundability. So lower chance of getting pregnant per menstrual cycle. So suggesting there could be some potential kind of acute exposures here. But again, something where we've looked at a lot of different comparisons and really needs to be replicated. Um, so I have a colleague who also kind of in the same study evaluated the relationship between air pollution exposure and pregnancy loss in the study. And again, a study that has this very early assessment of pregnancy loss. So for this, she evaluated um, air pollution exposure across the 18 weeks um, at the beginning of pregnancy. So up until when the last loss occurred for women who didn't have a pregnancy loss and then compared that to air pollution exposure up to the time of the loss for women who did um, experience a pregnancy loss. So for this study, she found um, a pretty striking relationship between higher ozone and higher fine particulate matter with a higher risk of pregnancy loss. And this is something that has been fairly consistent across a few other studies that have also attempted to look at loss and ones using fairly different approaches as well. So it seems to be kind of building a little bit of an evidence base for that. Um, so in addition to looking at reproductive exposures with um, thinking about you know, pregnancy and pregnancy loss. So we, we've also done some work looking at exposure uh, during early pregnancy related to what we're terming these placentally related complications. Um, so following implantation, um, there's some evidence suggesting that deficits deficits in the trophoblast invasion that occurs and the angiogenesis necessary for establishing the vascular that support the placenta, as you can see on the right, um, that when this process doesn't occur um, well, it can be linked to the development of something called placental insufficiency. Um, so this is when um, there's an inadequate transfer of both nutrients and oxygen to the developing fetus. Um, and this placental insufficiency has been linked um, potentially etiologically to several different later pregnancy complications, um, including fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia. Um, and so we wanted to look at um, and kind of thinking about the relationship between exposure to air pollution, but specifically earlier in pregnancy, thinking about this potential etiology in relationship to both of these complications. Um, so we did this um, in a study called the Consecutive Pregnancy Study. Um, so this was a study that enrolled 50,000 women who had two or more singleton pregnancies. So it's a little bit of a selected population. Um, and so they received care at one of 20 hospital sites in the Intermount Healthcare System in Utah. So mostly surrounding Salt Lake City. Um, and so for this study, pregnancy outcomes, as well as prenatal care information and demographics and other factors were abstracted from electronic healthcare records. Um, and because we lacked information on residents, um, CMAC, uh, the estimates taken from the CMAC model were actually averaged across the hospital referral re region. So here the air pollution estimates are gonna be a little more imprecise. Um, so first we wanted to ask the question of how air pollution, particularly earlier in pregnancy, might relate to risk of fetal growth restriction. Um, so in prior work, there's been somewhat conflicting associations between air pollution and kind of measures of low birth weight as kind of a proxy for thinking about growth restriction. Um, but one of the big challenges of doing this is actually a misclassification. So we have misclassification of air pollution, but also misclassification of the outcome that we're looking at. Um, so for studies that rely on low birth weight measures. So the issue is that there are multiple different factors in addition to fetal growth restriction that can lead to being lower birth weight. Um, and this can include in, um, um, an infant just being constitutionally small. You know, but very healthy, but still falling below that cut point. Um, we also have the issue, so in the third trimester of pregnancy, um, as opposed to the second trimester, where we're mostly worried about growth restriction occurring, where we have some more um, kind of important differentiation in organ development. Um, in the third trimester, we see more of a rapid um, um, body, body fat accumulation for, for the fetus. Um, and here we get a little bit more differentiation of actual, fetal, um, actual birth size at that point. So if we're seeing um, potential impacts of air pollution in the third trimester, 
on kind of growth at that point, it could be masking some of those earlier exposures that we're most concerned about that happened in the second trimester. Um, so because of this, so we wanted to compare how air pollution exposure relates to, so a birth weight based measure, which is small for gestational age. So this is being low birth weight, but standardized for the gestational age at which the birth occurred with the relationship of air pollution with an actual physician diagnosis of fetal growth restriction. And just to illustrate, so we, when we compare these two in cross tabs, so we saw really only moderate overlap between the physician diagnosis of fetal growth restri restriction and small for gestational age. So for example, for small for gestational age infants, the vast majority of them were not um, diagnosed with fetal growth restriction. Um, and then conversely, for those that were diagnosed with fetal growth restriction, a decent proportion of them didn't fall below the SGA cut point. So we're getting a little bit of a different measure for both of these. So first to show kind of what we saw for the relationship of air pollution with small for gestational age. So for this study, we had air pollution exposure across the first, second, and third trimesters. And as you can see, we didn't really see much of a relationship with first trimester exposure or second trimester exposure. But in the third trimester, we see this relationship of higher air pollution exposure with a higher chance of being born small for gestational age. So you notice we see a little bit of an inverse relationship with ozone. And I have to say, this is something we see fairly consistently with this study data. And I think it's, it's likely related to the fact that ozone is very strongly inversely correlated to a number of the other air pollutants. So kind of an artifact of that co-pollution confounding is, is kind of, the assumption that we're making. So for small participation age, it seems like that third trimester might be the more important exposure window. So conversely, we also looked at fetal growth restriction. Again, this is a physician diagnosis of fetal growth restriction. And you can see here, we were thinking we might be more concerned maybe about second, maybe about first trimester exposure. And we see relatively consistent associations across the trimesters of higher air pollution with higher risk of being diagnosed with fetal growth restriction. So this suggesting that when we use the birth weight based measures, we might be masking some of these relationships. So we also looked at so uh, the relationship of air pollution with another pregnancy complication that is thought to maybe have an um, etiology quite early in pregnancy um, related to placental insufficiency, and this is preeclampsia. Um, so there have been a number of studies that looked at air pollution with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy overall. And the findings there have, again, been somewhat consistent, inconsistent. So some showing a worse, you know, a, a higher risk, some showing a lower risk, and some finding no, no relationship. Um, but one issue is that these studies have often combined all hypertensive disorders of pregnancy together. Um, and this is a bit of a problem because they have, you know, different severity and how they actually um, impact women during pregnancy, but also potential different etiologies. So when we think about what windows are most important. Um, so for example, so for gestational hypertension. Um, so this is often, so this diagnosis newly elevated blood pressure after 20 weeks of gestation, but with no further kind of organ involvement that we see in pre eclampsia. And for some women who have gestational hypertension, it's thought this, this might just be due to the fact that, for, that late pregnancy can often serve as a stress test. So women have to pump maybe 50% more blood than usual. So if they have some underlying cardiovascular dysfunction, um, then that might um, come up as higher blood pressure at that point. Um, and preeclampsia, Conversely, is also diagnosed as newly elevated blood pressure, but with additional evidence of systemic organ dysfunction. And it's not that preeclampsia might originate um, or might be related to placental insufficiency and also this excessive release of anti-angiogenic factors a little bit later in pregnancy. Um, and preeclampsia, when it's severe, um, can be life-threatening for a mom um, and can also in some cases necessitate preterm delivery. Um, so being able to differentiate these and understanding what are those relevant windows of exposure is really important. Um, so for this, so, so we were hypothesizing that for gestational hypertension, we would see more important exposure windows around mid to late pregnancy first. Um, and so for this study, so we only focused on looking at the first and second trimester because we do get some truncation of third trimester. Um, measures for um, women who have preterm birth with preeclampsia, making potentially introducing some bias. 
Um, but you can see, so for gestational hypertension, so we saw maybe a little bit of an elevated risk in the first trimester for um, nitrogen dioxide, but more of a consistent elevated risk in the second trimester for a diagnosis with gestational hypertension. And this is in line with what we see in the general population where air pollution exposure is often associated with higher blood pressure. So we then hypothesized that um, the relationship of air pollution with preeclampsia, we would see a stronger signal for first trimester exposure. Um, and we actually found, we did find a stronger signal for first trimester exposure, but it was actually in the opposite direction than we we're hypothesizing. So as you can see, we found higher air pollution exposure in the first trimester to be associated with a lower risk of preeclampsia. Um, but you'll notice, so we see that signal for ozone, um, but we've seen that kind of consistently in some other, other uh, analyses, but we also see a particularly strong inverse signal for carbon monoxide. So this was something that was curious and something, so we went back into the literature and the few studies that have looked at this relationship with preeclampsia also found um, fairly consistently a similar um, association with carbon monoxide um, earlier in pregnancy and often writing this off. Um, but this is kind of important because carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide is actually a vasodilator. Um, and here in, has been hypothesized to be involved in aiding placental perfusion earlier in pregnancy. And it's actually been theorized that some of the association we see between cigarette smoking and in a really strong decrease in preeclampsia could be explained by that high exposure to carbon monoxide. Um, so thinking here, so we're actually potentially picking up that impact of carbon monoxide. And then again, some issues and how we tease apart the relationship between other air pollutants. Um, so this is kind of interesting and a potential problem though, when we think about, so we know air pollution is related to higher risk of fetal growth restriction and is higher risk of preterm birth as well, including in this study. So how does this inverse relationship with preeclampsia kind of impact how we're able to look at earlier pregnancy exposures with some of these other complications. Um, so we did kind of like a quick and dirty way of just trying to evaluate how these factors might play out. Um, so we did an analysis where we kind of stratified by women who had preeclampsia versus those who didn't have preeclampsia um, and looked within these groups the relationship in the first trimester between exposure to air pollution and development of fetal growth restriction, and then also preterm birth separately. And you can see for the group that did not have preeclampsia, so we see fairly consistent associations between higher air pollution exposure and higher risk of fetal growth restriction and preterm birth. Um, and the associations for fetal growth restriction are a little bit stronger than the ones I just showed you previously. And then conversely to that, we see the opposite for preeclampsia, particularly for carbon monoxide. So we see quite a decrease in risk of fetal growth restriction among women with preeclampsia as well as preterm birth. Um, and as if, and here kind of hypothesizing, so if even among women who have preeclampsia, if carbon monoxide is related to a less severe form of that, we could see less of those resulting pregnancy complications. But I think again, highlighting how understanding these mechanisms in order to really understand the impact of air pollution on uh, pregnancy complications is really vital and for teasing that out and looking at these relevant windows. So to provide a summary of just some of our work in this area, so we've seen so potential acute associations of air pollution around windows of conception, implantation, as well as some early pregnancy windows around um, uh, placentation to be related to pregnancy, but also then pregnancy loss. And again, some research suggesting that exposure in the first trimester in particular may be associated with what we're terming these placentally mediated complications, but with differential relationships by outcome. Um, so I wanna spend the rest of this time kind of talking about how we're thinking of moving forward from this point. Um, in order to build a stronger evidence base around this. So this includes identifying relevant mechanisms and honing in on that, replication of some of these findings across studies in different populations, and as well as moving towards refining our exposure assessments. Again, because we're looking at a lot of misclassification when we look at air pollution in these studies. Um, so for thinking about mechanism, I wanted to start by presenting a little bit of the work that we've done, kind of thinking about some of these mechanisms that might be related to air pollution exposure and how they relate to pregnancy and pregnancy loss and focusing specifically on um, measures of oxidative stress, 
and also blood pressure, thinking this as a measure of vascular function. Um, and so for both of these, this was work done um, in the effects of aspirin and gestation reproduction or the EAGER trial. Um, so this is another time to pregnancy study. It's a little bit bigger. It enrolled 1,228 women who are attempting pregnancy, followed them for up to six menstrual cycles. Um, and this trial also feed featured a randomization to aspirin or placebo, and with the main point of seeing whether this improved rates of pregnancy and reduced risk of pregnancy loss. Um, and participants were enrolled in Salt Lake City, Denver, Buffalo, and Scranton. So for oxidative stress, um, so for this, we're evaluating isoprostanes. So these are stable biomarkers of lipid, peroxidase, lipid peroxidation that are excreted, excreted in urine. So it's a relatively non-invasive biomarker to collect. Um, so it's created through the free radical peroxidation of arachidonic acid, which is a polyunsaturated fatty acid um, that then forms um, four regioisomers. Um, so for this study, so we, we looked at four different forms of those isoprostanes, and this includes eight isoprostaglandin F2 alpha um, over here on the right, which is in the 15 series. Um, and this is the most commonly assessed isoprostane. It's been strongly related to a number of different environmental exposures, as well as in a number of different um, pathophysiologic um, outcomes. Um, and we additionally looked at a major metabolite of that, but this excreted um, in greater abundance in urine, um, as well as two stereoisomers in the F series. And so for this, um, because we're using a time to pregnancy study, we have a really unique opportunity to look at both preconception as well as very early pregnancy levels of these biomarkers. Um, so for the trial, so we had a preconception measure that was around the time of menses and the first menstrual cycle follow-up. And then for women who became pregnant, we looked at exposures at just or levels of gestational week four, um, which is around the time of positive pregnancy test. And then for these looked at their relationship with pregnancy and then pregnancy loss. So I'm first gonna present the findings for thinking about kind of preconception, oxidative stress. Um, and so for this, so we found a fairly robust relationship between higher preconception isoprostane exposure. So this is for an interquartile increase in isoprostanes with lower fecundability, kind of across the different isoprostanes that we evaluated. And we also found, so for a little bit of evidence suggesting a relationship of preconception isoprostanes with a higher risk of pregnancy loss, although we found this kind of less consistently across the different um, isomers that we looked at. Um, so this suggesting that, you know, with air pollution, we often kind of have this black box kind of mechanistic piece um, where we say it increases inflammation, increases oxidative stress, but here we see the important role of oxidative stress in fecundability and potentially in pregnancy loss. So this ability to say, can we look at how does air pollution affect some of these mechanisms? So we also in the study had the opportunity to look at, well, how do these levels change from preconception to gestational week four? Are they stable across that time period? And then for levels at gestational week four, how might that relate to pregnancy loss? Um, and I think what we found here was relatively interesting. Um, so you can see, so here for an example is 8 isoprostaglandin F2 alpha, and you can see we saw a relatively big increase from levels at preconception to levels of gestational week four. So this is a median and interquartile range. Um, and we saw this consistently across all of the isoprostanes we assessed, some even doubling as we went into early pregnancy. Um, and this to us seeming to suggest that, so for this measure, we might be picking up something going on early in that establishment of pregnancy. Because um, we know there are important inflammatory factors and other things um, that relate to implantation and those early processes that could be measured in these urinary metabolites. And along with that piece, so we also found um, at gestational week four, higher isoprostane levels were actually related to a lower risk of pregnancy loss and a markedly lower risk of pregnancy loss. So this again, seeming to suggest um, that we're picking up something in this measure endogenous um, that relates to this process of implantation. And for women who have a loss, we might be picking up less of those biomarkers. Um, and I think this for me really highlighting the importance of understanding these processes. So in that isoprostenes at gestational week four may not be an appropriate measure of exogenous sources of oxidative stress. So we've also some, done some work looking at blood pressure in both preconception as well as early pregnancy. Um, and I think this is particularly interesting because 
we have a relatively healthy cohort who enrolled in the EGER trial. So women who had hypertension were excluded from enrollment. Um, so we have the vast majority of women in the study who are normotensive. Um, and in this cohort, so we looked at the relationships, so between blood pressure, so at enrollment as well, so early in follow-up, and how that related to both fecundability and pregnancy loss. So interestingly, we found no relationship with fecundability after adjusting for BMI, which seemed to be a very strong confounder. But we did see a relationship, particularly for diastolic blood pressure and mean arterial pressure, which is a combined measure, um, with risk of pregnancy loss. Um, and this was actually even stronger when we looked specifically at the placebo group versus the low dose aspirin group. Um, so this suggesting, again, that we're picking up a biomarker um, preconceptually that might be related to some of these risks um, related to adverse reproductive outcomes. And to think about how do we then build that evidence for what are those impacts we're seeing related to air pollution. Um, so some future research, so I'm hoping to do related to thinking about mechanisms more. Um, so we've observed in this association of some preconception biomarkers of oxidative stress and blood pressure and thinking potentially as a marker of vascular function with both fecundability and pregnancy loss. Um, and some evidence that biomarkers early in pregnancy could actually represent some underlying reproductive processes and may be less useful as markers. Um, so I'm hoping for a next step to extend this research um, to evaluate, so in the same study, so the relationship of air pollution exposure during some of these sensitive preconception and early pregnancy windows with fecundability and pregnancy loss. Um, and so for this, allowing the opportunity to replicate findings from the life study that I presented earlier. So looking at some of these acute exposure windows, do we see consistency across studies and across populations? Um, but also the opportunity to assess biomarkers using stored biospecimens to look at oxidative stress, changes in oxidative stress, as well as some environmental toxins at select time points during kind of the menstrual cycle and into early pregnancy. So we can better understand those changes, how that relates to pregnancy and pregnancy loss, and what, how air pollution might interact with those, with those effects. Um, so I also wanted to briefly um, talk about some other future research or hoping you related to men's reproductive health. So everything I presented um, till this point focused on exposures for women. Um, but there's you know, been an increasing evidence of thinking about kind of men's impact of environmental exposure to men's fertility and actually thinking about kind of pre almost preconception care for men. Um, and so so we know, so ambient environmental exposures for men, so could certainly impact fertility and fecundability, but there's being emerging research related to epigenetics and other factors that suggest um, that men's exposures may also translate to um, fetal development, to pregnancy complications and pregnancy health, as well as to later offspring health as well. Um, and so for air pollution, there's this added difficulty of how do we actually tease apart exposure windows for for male partners versus female partners and how those relate to joint outcomes. Um, so the one area where there's been more work on this related to air pollution is a relationship of air pollution and semen quality. Um, so the majority of the studies that have done this have looked at this relationship among um, men who are usually exposed to very high levels of air pollution. Um, and so there have been fairly consistent associations between air pollution and some semen quality um, outcomes, but some inconsistency against related to, you know, which air pollutants and which actual um, semen quality parameters. Um, there's been less research done in countries with more low to moderate air pollution like we see in the United States. So we did do one study, um, also in the life study, um, looking at the relationship with air pollution and semen quality. So in this study, we had two separate measures of semen quality for male partners in that study. Um, and so we evaluated the relationship of the criteria air pollutants um, with um, outcomes including um, total, including motility, morphology, um, DNA fragmentation, um, as well as count and concentration. And overall, didn't see too much of a signal for looking at that relationship. Where we did see a little bit of effect was related to fine particulate matter. So we saw an association of fine particulate with some morphological parameters, but also, um, so we found particulate matter exposure earlier in the process of spermatogenesis um, to have a potential relationship with lower 24 hour motility. Um, with thinking about some important potential impacts on fertility. Um, and one of the few other studies that has looked at air pollution and semen quality in the United States 
um, was conducted um, among men seeking infertility treatment um, in Salt Lake City. And so this study looked at 1,677 men, and they evaluated um, fine particulate matter in monthly averages, but they found something relatively similar. So PM, PM 2.5 exposure in the two to three months prior to the sample collection was also in that study associated with lower motility. So again, something we see a little bit of consistency for and something we're hoping to pers pursue further. Um, so for this, so looking at some future work, um, evaluating the relationship of air pollution as well as ambient temperature with semen quality um, among uh, 2,370 men in a rec the recently completed folic acid and zinc supplementation trial. Um, so this would be the largest study to date looking at these exposures, um, but also in addition to looking at semen quality, um, so we're hoping to also look at the relationship of air pollution to sperm DNA methylation. So to get at some of those potential epigenetic changes, and then to link that to also looking at exposure windows in relation to outcomes of infertility treatment. Because among studies that have found associations with semen quality, we don't really know how that translates actual to fertility and to pregnancy. Um, and so for this too, we're also focusing on thinking about some more of the biologically relevant windows um, and kind of linking up. So over the process of spermatogenesis, so thinking about where do we expect to see air pollution exposure to be most relevant and what are those key outcomes we're looking at at those different time points. Um, so finally, all together, so things, so, you know, the plan, so for moving forward, it's you know, so my focus is on kind of leveraging existing resources to say, how can we build out this understanding better? Um, and the idea of building towards more kind of novel research. Um, and ideally kind of moving towards um, potentially, you know, looking at something like a very early pregnancy cohort that evaluates pregnancy loss and pregnancy complications, um, incorporating individual measures of air pollution exposure so we can better understand those critical windows, but also look at factors like GPS and personal monitoring to see if we can address some of that misclassification and better, better look at those mechanisms. Um, and just to illustrate kind of <laughs> where, how this issue kind of affects a lot of this research. So, um, so these are findings from the recently completed BWAL mom study. Um, so this is a study led by Pauline Mandola, and this project specifically was led by Sandy Ha, um, a colleague. Um, and this is showing for a sub-study in that, um, so looking at levels of air pollution exposure for women, so estimated at their residence, but then also estimated um, looking at linking ambient exposure to GPS, so where they actually move, and then comparing that to personal monitor data, so that actually they're wearing an air pollution monitor for those days. And so for residents and GPS, they're relatively similar. Um, but for personal monitor, you can see enormous differences. So much higher PM 2.5 exposure and much lower ozone and nitrogen dioxide exposure. Um, so if we're focused on thinking about like etiologic factors and thinking about mechanisms, having that more precise estimate of exposure is, is really important. Um, so altogether, so, you know, kind of the focus here is building, um, building towards an evidence base. Um, and that preconception and early pregnancy really represent critical windows for ambient environmental exposures. Um, and a lot of these exposures occur prior to pregnancy and often before a woman might even know she's pregnant um, and have these really important implications for parental and offspring health. Um, and given that about half of pregnancies um, occur um, are unintended, you know, we really have to think about and frame preconception and pregnancy health as being broader population health. Um, and it's important to understand how does our ambient environment impact the ability of couples and individuals to establish a healthy pregnancy, and that being kind of one of our primary goals um, and setting policies for air pollution exposure. Okay, so with this, I'd like to um, thank um, so folks um, that I've worked, so folks um, for the studies that I've worked with who, you know, um, and, and uh, as well as additional collaborators um, at the NACHD. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Carrie. I know that represents many, you know, um, articles and work that was done by a whole host of people. Um, and it's really impressive. I was wondering, I'm going to start with the question and let other people sort of think about stuff is, 
you know, given the fact that, um, especially in the studies for the pregnancy um, related to both fetal growth restriction, as well as the pregnancy complications, there's a lot of residual confounding. And so I wondered how you can um, perhaps talk about the, the correlation between air pollution and other social determinants of health that actually might also be contributing um, to the effects that you're seeing. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a really important question. And I think so for when we're looking at ambient air pollution exposure, it's often that kind of that area level confounding that we're most concerned about. So we know there's been a lot of studies in the United States that show um, higher air pollution levels. So in low income communities and historically marginalized communities. Um, so disentangling that um, from, from other effects is, is one of the big challenges. And I will say for the, for the um, study that I presented where we looked at low growth restriction, where we looked at preeclampsia, we really lacked good information on look, looking at some of those um, socioeconomic position factors. Um, so I think ideally, so at the individual level, um, so we can in part try to control for some of those factors. So looking at things like income and education very incompletely, um, but agree that kind of taking into account, you know, thinking about kind of more kind of the spatial distribution of how we look at other factors is, is, is very important. If other people want to raise their hands, we can call on them or yeah, Alicia. Hi, um, great talk, Carrie. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, I was wondering about um, if you have the capabilities to look at any of these environmentally persistent free radicals um, within any of your studies. Um, I know that seems to be you know, kind of one of those missing links between you know, the oxidative stress side of things and the air pollution exposure. And so I was just wondering if that was anything that you were able to or advanced to include in any of your work? Yeah, and I think, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So for, for these studies, so the modeling approach that we used, so we're somewhat limited in the exposures we're actually able to look at. Um, so that's kind of, you know, so we're really focused on the criteria air pollutants. That's where we have, you know, that's where the models have been most well validated and kind of corrected for and thinking about some of that, the imprecisions that we might see. Um, and so you really haven't been able to delve into kind of some of those factors as well, but it's something I would love to chat more about, um, you know, to kind of touch base. I think, you know, especially for, for thinking about ever moving forward to doing kind of a new cohort, um, you know, understanding those mechanisms and, and thinking about those factors is, is extremely important. While we're waiting, maybe on other, other questions. I do have one more. Oh, Sue, go. <laughs> I just have one question that always, always piques my interest talking about exposure measurement, what you showed at the end. Um, and, you know, the opportunities for uh, kind of personal monitoring uh, really would be really cool. But there, there were so many differences here that it just made me wonder looking at like the the residence monitors or you know what you've used have have you been able to account for the amount of time they're indoors outdoors do they work locally do they work elsewhere you know that kind of additional information because i would think that would make a huge difference and i didn't know if that was brought into the um estimates that you're currently working with yeah, no, I, th I think that's a great, that's a great question. So I think some of the difference we see, so for the first two measures, so we're looking at ambient exposure measures. So for this, so we have, so specifically at the residence and the GPS takes into account somewhere where women move around to. Um, but one of the issues there, and I think this is because it was pulling from closest monitor data. So there's not gonna be a lot of variability. So kind of, it's kind of dependent on how precise um, and kind of local your ambient measures are. So how you can even take that into account. Um, so for the personal monitor data, so that's taking into account things like, you know, indoor air pollution or how you commute. So are you, you know, do you walk down the street to, to get the bus? Do you walk to work? Are you in a car where you have different levels of exposure? Um, so that's gonna reflect more of this kind of real life exposure and it's gonna reflect a lot of sources of air pollution separate from looking at those ambient levels. And I think the questions you're talking about, so are you indoor, are you outdoor? 
it kind of relates to those questions, but there's a lot of missing holes too. So even for indoor, how do we estimate indoor air pollution exposure? Like, does someone have a gas stove? Do they have a wood burner? Like, what, what does that environment look like? It, it can get a little bit tricky. I was even thinking of such things like if you're looking at ambient, you know, you might, someone that is inside most of the time, you could downweight their exposure. So they, even though mm -hmm. that's where they live, you yeah. downweight it given the amount of estimated exposure time they would have, that type of thing. Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting suggestion. So I don't, so for this study, I don't think it collected quite, it's, it's a smaller number, number of women. And I don't think it collected quite that amount of information on indoor versus outdoor. Um, and I don't know of another study that has done that, but I would be very interested um, <laughs> in kind of having that information. I think it's a very worthwhile pursuit, you know, as we try to think about how do we actually best measure personal exposure and do so in a way that's actually feasible for the larger study sizes we actually need to do for air pollution. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for your presentation. I know we stand between everybody and dinner. Um, and so, <laughs> and even for yourself. So thank you so much for a lovely presentation.